So uh, thanks for the intro. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, it's been a great day so far, and I'm looking forward uh, to more of it. So a couple of talks earlier today were about how can we reason about code that provides less static type information. We heard about hack. We heard about Python. So I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to talk about reasoning about code that provides more static type information or stronger static type guarantees uh, in the Rust programming language. And I'm going to do this in a context of deductive verification, but I think some of my key messages apply equally to static analysis and in particular abstract interpretation. So let me start out with a motivation of a little heap manipulating program written in C. So this program uh, is a function that takes two pointers to two lists, and then it remembers the length of the list B in a local variable. Then it appends an element to list A, and then it would like to assert that the length of B has not changed. And so this assertion expresses some kind of functional property that a programmer might be interested in for whatever reason, and we would like to verify that. But before we can even get to the point where we can reason about functional behavior, there are other properties we need to prove first, typically. So for instance, we need to prove memory safety. Just one example, the B arrow len might fail for various reasons. Maybe B is null, maybe the memory has not been uh, allocated uh, or not been initialized. So memory safety proofs are typically a prerequisite to proving functional correctness. And we need to reason about aliasing. If A and B are alias, then the property doesn't hold, but if there are different separate lists, then the property, property seems to hold. And moreover, if you are in a setting where the program might run concurrent, in a concurrent setting, then we need to worry about data races. Maybe the assertion doesn't hold because we have races and other threats manipulate our data structures in between. And so all of these problems show up in reasoning, and they show up no matter what kind of technique you apply in order to actually reason about your code. So the way we typically approach such problems in deductive verification these days is via separation logic. So the idea of separation logic is that you have a notion of ownership. You can express in the logic that a function owns a memory location and therefore has exclusive access to it. So separation logic expresses this with these points to predicates. Uh, but now if you want to talk about unbounded data structures like a dynamically allocated list, you need to abstract over those uh, points to predicates. And this is typically done with inductive lists. So we would say we have a list which starts in B. So therefore our client function would have one such list predicate and another one for the second parameter A. And now finally we need to express that uh, correctness depends on the fact that those two lists are disjoint in memory and separation logic does that with a separating, uh, separating conjunction. And now we have the, the key, the core ingredients for a separation logic proof, but if you would like to automate such proofs, you need even more. So for instance, uh, tools that check separation logic proofs typically need all kinds of auxiliary annotations, for instance, to decide when the prover should unfold the predicate into its definition and vice versa. And so everything you see on this slide contributes to the overhead that the verifier, I mean, the, the person who wants to verify the code needs to deal with in two ways. There's a lot of extra annotations you need to be put in the code, which is painful. And there's also an intellectual complexity, right? You need to work on the level of a separation logic, which is not completely trivial. So for programmers, there's like a whole different formalism in addition to the programming language that they need to master and need to be able to write specifications in. So that's exactly the kind of problem we like to address in this work. So let's look at the same example in Rust. So the example looks very, very similar. Uh, we have a client that takes two lists. We remember the length of the B list. We append to the A list, and we want to prove that the B list length hasn't changed. And so in the end, we still would like to prove this functional behavior. But now the difference is that we have a very, very strong type system. So Rust types have this notion of ownership built in. So therefore, Rust can check properties that we would normally check during verification, such as memory safety. So memory safety comes completely for free. We know that null pointer exception or double free or access to uninitialized memory, all these things cannot happen in a type correct Rust program. Moreover, Rust has a rule that is called aliasing XOR mutation meaning that if you have a pointer, you know that either the pointer is not aliased or it's not usable for mutations. And so in our particular example, this mute here uh, in front of the list, so this indicates 
that these are two pointers that can be used for mutation, and therefore they cannot be aliased. Okay, so we know just from the signature that A and B point to lists that are completely disjoint in memory. So what we have in Rust is really controlled aliasing. And finally, Rust uses this notion of ownership to show during type checking that programs are data race free. So data races cannot occur in type safe Rust code. And so the starting point of our research project, which has been going on for quite a, quite a while now, uh, roughly five years, was to figure out how can we exploit this type system to simplify verification. And so what we did in order to do that is we, uh, we built a verifier that is called Prusty. And this verifier takes a Rust program with annotations like loop invariants, for instance, as input. And it produces a proof and separation logic that can be checked by an existing tool. In this case, we use Viper, but one could use other kinds of separation logic checkers. And uh, if the tool finds any errors, we report them back to the level of Rust so that the programmer either gets an OK or an error message. And so now I would like to explain to you in the, in the couple of minutes that I have on a very, very high level how Prusty achieves that. So what we do in Prusty is the following. We take the type declarations of the Rust program, and out of those, we completely automatically synthesize the separation logic predicates that we need to describe these data structures. Out of the signatures of the Rust program, we synthesize what I call here the core pre and post conditions. So pre and post conditions that talk about ownership of memory, but not of functional properties yet, so just the, the ownership aspects. Out of various internal information that the Rust compiler, the Rust type checker maintains, we synthesize these auxiliary annotations that a separation logic proof checker takes. And the only thing that really comes from the user is the functional specification, which we then conveniently conjoin to our pre and post conditions. And now this approach does not only reduce the complexity a lot because the um, the programmer does not have to deal with separation logic anymore. So these user specifications are now essentially just slightly extended Rust expressions. So we are basically in first order logic uh, expressed in a Rust syntax, which makes it much, much conceptually much, much easier for a programmer to write these specifications. And the total amount of annotations that needs to be written also goes down dramatically. So let me give you a very, very high level idea what this looks like. So if we look at a type declaration, like here is the declaration of my list. It's a list of integers. And this is the Rust type for a reference or for a pointer to the rest of the list. Then we would take this list and synthesize out of it a list predicate and separation logic, which takes a reference as a parameter. And now because of these declarations, we know that the list contains two fields, a val field and a next field. And we use those to put the points to predicates, which Viper writes like this. So this basically says the list predicates owns these two memory locations. And ownership in Rust is transitive. So all data structures in Rust are tree structures in memory. And so when you own the root of the tree, you own the entire tree. So therefore, if val is an integer and next is a, a, um, a boxed list, we get those predicates recursively here inside the predicate. So if you follow the recursion here, then eventually we get back to another list. And this kind of describes the entire data structure. So now we have a separation logic predicate, which is already uh, useful. And now we can use that to describe the signature of the function as a pre and post condition. And so by the fact that this takes two mutable lists, we know that what's go what goes in are these two lists. We know that they are separate because they are mutable, so they cannot be aliased. Now all we need to do is write exactly that as a specification uh, in our Viper program. So the precondition is we want list A and list B, and we defined list on the previous slide, and we give the same two predicates back to our caller, such that now the caller owns that. And now the nice thing is that once we have that part fully automatically synthesized, now, if the programmer wants to add functional specifications, all you need to do in the encoding is to conjoin those to the automatically generated separation logic specs. So this is just like a layer on top which sits on top of your memory safety proof. 
So here I show a really simplified case which deals with kind of the simplest types in Rust. This encoding is much more complicated if you look into Rust features like borrowing and other things, but I don't have the time to explain how that works. However, we do support most of these features. And so in order to see how far this idea actually takes us, uh, we did a very, um, a very comprehensive evaluation. So we uh, looked at the 500 most downloaded uh, Rust crates. So a crate is like a package, it's a module in Rust. And uh, we took all of the functions that fall into the subset that our tool supports. So these are almost 12,000 functions, uh, 40,000 lines of code in total. And we uh, applied this approach uh, to those functions and it turned out it actually worked in 100% of the cases. There was not a single function for which we were not able to generate the memory safety proof in separation logic automatically and check it in the Viper tool. And let me just emphasize again, this includes all of the auxiliary annotations that a tool like Viper needs to automate the proof. So these are roughly uh, one million lines of Viper code that we generate out of this 40,000 uh, lines of Rust code and 10% of those are just auxiliary annotations to help find the proof and every single one of them is synthesized automatically. Okay, again, this is just a memory safety proof, so here we don't prove any functional properties yet, but layering those on top then is relatively easy. As I just showed you, you specify them using a Rust syntax and you conjoin them automatically to pre and post conditions. So if I, uh, if I uh, wrap this up, so my, my point here is that if you use Rust, then you really simplify reasoning dramatically. There was always this intuition behind the Rust language that Rust would be able to do this, and I believe we were the first ones to actually demonstrate that you can cash in on this promise and actually make uh, any kind of reasoning. We did it for deductive verification, but I believe any kind of reasoning much, much simpler, and you can do this in a very predictable way. So now a big uh, limitation in that sense is that everything I explained here talks about what people call safe Rust. So the subset of the language that follows the rules of the type system. However, such a type system is sometimes too restrictive. So for instance, you cannot build cyclic data structures in safe Rust. It's just simply not possible. Or you cannot implement a log-free data structure for concurrency. So whenever the type system becomes too restrictive, what Rust programmers do is they escape into what's called unsafe Rust. And unsafe Rust lets you do many of the things that C would also let you do, like pointer manipulations, data races, all of these things are possible. So therefore, uh, this nice approach that I tried to present here works only on the safe subset. Um, however, there is this uh, so-called Rust hypothesis which claims that in practice, you can always hide unsafe Rust inside a library behind safe abstractions, such that from the client perspective, it, appear, it appears as if it was completely safe, even though internally it isn't. And so we did an empirical study on that, and it turns out really most open source projects out there using Rust actually follow this Rust hypothesis, so our uh, work still supports applications that use unsafe libraries as long as these unsafe libraries are hidden behind safe abstractions. But I think actually we've seen several talks today about multi-language analysis, and I think that would be a great use case for all of these frameworks because safe Rust and unsafe Rust, this feels almost like two different languages. And I think it would be fantastic to see how these multi-language frameworks apply to such a setting and to what extent they can preserve the simplicity of reasoning about Rust uh, in the presence of a much more complicated language such as unsafe Rust. So that's all I have today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any question? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you spoke about data racers, and then it was finished. You never mentioned data racers. It is because you reduce data racers to ownership and uh, ownership must be separate. Exactly. So ah, you know okay. that every memory location can be owned by only one thread at a time. And so by definition, you cannot have a data so race. So when you create circularities, uh, you have no problem provided. You uh, can only have circularities in unsafe code. Ah. 
And unsafe code, yes, can have data races, but not safe code. Okay. I have a question about how you wrap uh, unsafe code into safe abstraction. Um, you, you, don't, you, do, you don't even have to look into the unsafe code and it's completely sufficient to see the interface and uh, you can deal with it completely? Well, so there are, there are many flavors of unsafe code in Rust. So if you look at uh, one simple example, imagine you want to build a doubly linked list. A doubly linked list you need to write in unsafe code because it's in a sense a cyclic structure, right? So, um, but the abstraction is just the abstraction of a list. You don't need to know that internally it's doubly linked, so you just have an append and the remove and so on, so you can completely hide that, and therefore such a library would not affect the soundness of our verifier. But there are forms of unsafe code where things get trickier. So for instance, uh, Rust has a concept called interior mutability, uh, which allows you, using unsafe code, to change a data structure even if you have only an immutable shared reference. And if you call such an operation, mm -hmm. then you create effects that you can still observe in the safe code, but that could never be implemented in safe code. And so that is something that we currently don't support. Uh, we have a student working on this. The paper is actually in the process of being written, so we will have an extension soon. But the approach that I did presented here would not be sound in the presence of interior mutability. Any other question? Okay, thanks again. Peter. Thank you.